Hello, um, my name is Matthew, and I'm going to be asking Francisco Dominguez, the Secretary of the Venezuela Solidarity Campaign and long-term campaigner on Latin American human rights, self-determination and solidarity issues, um, some questions about today's anniversary, which is the anniversary of the coup against Hugo Chavez, who at that time was the elected president of Venezuela, um, and the lessons for today. Thank you for coming along, Francisco. Um, First of all, for people who perhaps are newer to these issues or yet younger activists, can you give us a brief account of what happened in that coup against Hugo Chavez? Yeah, between the 11th and the 13th of April in 2002, the right wing, in with the support of the United States, managed to, I would say, um, kidnap the president, Hugo Chavez, who had been elected in 1999. And then they established a new government, de facto government. And in about 48 hours, they abolished absolutely everything that was democratic, starting from the constitution, the Supreme Court, the National Electoral Council, the National Assembly, and everything else that was part of the democracy. And they would have got away with it had it not been for the masses that came out in large numbers surrounded not only the presidential palace demanding you know the, that Chavez came back but also in the country which is less known at the time uh, they surrounded all the military barracks demanding the military to produce Chavez and to restore democracy and the coup collapsed and it lasted only 47 hours and Chavez was brought back to power by the masses and democracy was restored uh, Chavez had been elected in 1999, and ever since the United States have been trying to overthrow him, and on that occasion they managed, even though temporarily. And I suppose something that is well known through the work of Oliver Stone's TV series and other things is that the US coups in Latin America was nothing new with the coup against Chavez. This is sort of a pattern of behaviour going back decades, and also one which has continued since in countries such as Honduras. But I guess. One key difference is that this coup, in terms of affecting a coups before and since, is that this coup was defeated. Yeah, I mean, the United States has been organizing coup d'etat in Latin America for as long as the United States has been a powerful country, I, was, I would guess. Has been intervening very heavily into the, you know, self-determination of the nations with heavy interference. And the most famous ones are obviously the attempt to um, destroyed the Cuban Revolution by an invasion in 1961. The invasion of the Dominican Republic by U.S. Marines disguised as UN soldiers in 1965. And the most famous one of them all, certainly in Europe and internationally, is the coup d'etat against Salvador Allende in Chile, my country originally. And then, you know, from there on, they went on to organize several coup d'etat in Brazil, in Bolivia, in Peru, and so forth, and they launched a horrible, disgusting campaign of extermination of the left in Central America, costing hundreds of thousands of lives. After the election of Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, we changed the relation of forces quite substantially in the region. The United States began to organize what is known as constitutional coups, which are, you know, actually coup d'etat by, by the name. And they managed to successfully waged a coup d'etat in Honduras in 2009. They tried a coup d'etat against Rafael Correa in Ecuador in 2010. They managed to get rid of Fernando Lugo in another constitutional coup d'etat in Paraguay. And then later on, they orchestrated, you know, the campaign against Dilma Rousseff in 2014 to 2016, and they managed to impeach her through their supporters, right wing supporters in Brazil. And then they managed to prevent Lula from being elected president. And there is more, but you get an idea. And recently in 2019, with the participation of the United States, the right wing in Bolivia managed to wage a coup d'etat against Evo Morales. And that's what we are. So in terms of Venezuela, they never stop trying to use every imaginable foul means to overthrow the government. And I guess um, one of the reasons why they were so desperate to overthrow Hugo Chavez and government since is because of Venezuela's oil reserves, but also the 
political strategic importance you mentioned of those changes in terms of the region. What other examples have there been since that coup of other ways the US has tried to undermine and overthrow Venezuela's government? I mean, Venezuela has the largest deposits of oil in the planet. And it has some of the largest deposits of gold in the planet. And it is in terms of, you know, shipping the oil to the United States, it's about four days to get to Texas or to Florida. Whereas the oil from the Middle East takes about 45 days. And you've seen the complications in the Suez Canal recently, and you can imagine if you are a US strategist, how interested you are in this. And since the coup d'etat failed in 2002, they went for all sorts of measures to try to, one, destabilize the Bolivarian government in Venezuela to get rid of it in order to lay their hands over these huge precious resources. They try all sorts of means, you know, particularly violent ones, mobilizing what they call civil society in order to pretend that it's a fight for democracy against dictatorship, that kind of narrative. And they tried that in 2008, they tried that in 2009, 2010, several attempts at a coup in between. In 2014, they went for a wave of violence, literally street violence with barricades, similar to the recent one against Nicaragua, also orchestrated by the United States in 2014, which lasted six months. And then they went again for the same thing in 2017, at last of the gain in the last six months, with the number of casualties being terrible, with the losses in public and private property being terrible. And the whole idea was to stabilize, to create a, a situation where um, they could claim the country was not able to control itself so as to justify an external intervention. And ever since the election of Trump, even though the process began with Barack Obama, they began a, a, a regime of sanctions against Venezuela, you know, what is known as unilateral coercive measures, um, which was essentially to build up a system of blockade. And now Venezuela is almost totally blockaded. And in between, they have tried mercenary attacks, militarization of so-called humanitarian aid, and even the assassination of the president through drones um, managed from the United States, but also guided from Colombia. And you can see the pictures and then paramilitaries and all the rest of it. And they haven't succeeded, they have failed. So it is possible that, you know, they might try again. And one of the uh, things that is going on now is, is some serious military tension between Colombia and Venezuela, which I want to comment later on. But the, the, um, the United States is determined to asphyxiate the Venezuelan economy in order to produce a horrible humanitarian crisis through the collapse of the economy, so as to just justify what they call a humanitarian crisis, so as to intervene from outside. And um, you mentioned the word humanitarian there. Could you tell us a bit more about some of the humanitarian effects of sanctions in terms of how they affect ordinary sort of ordinary people because obviously a lot of the discussion about sanctions on Venezuela, Iran and other countries often focuses on government officials for example but also these sanctions are so far reaching they have a big impact on people's everyday lives. Yeah the the pretense that you know the sanctions of the United States do not affect ordinary people I just completely collapsed, the mask is off. Um, Trump, in his period of government, he inflicted three, over 300 measures, you know, such measures, such sanctions against the Venezuelan economy. They targeted oil, they targeted uh, any transaction, financial transactions by the Venezuelan authorities. They targeted medicine, which is disgusting, and they also targeted food. It was so bad that they even persecuted the United States, persecuted a, a Mexican company that was exporting food to Venezuela as part of the program of food, you know, subsidized food distribution that the Venezuelan government has. And they targeted this company and they managed to bankrupt it. 
So that gives you an idea how bad it is. Now, there was a report by the Center of Economic and Policy Research produced in 2019, where they reckon that the sanctions applied by um, Trump between 2017 and 2019 alone, only that year, uh, led to the unnecessary death of 40,000 Venezuelans. And ever since, I think the number of them has increased quite dramatically. Some people suggest, some research suggests that it's in the region of 100,000. Now, all of these sanctions have been deliberately intensified in the context of the pandemic. It couldn't be something more, much, much you know, worse than that. And in every single international protocol, definition of the United Nations and other multilateral bodies. This amounts to a crime against humanity. And this is a crime against humanity of 30 million people in Venezuela. This is totally unacceptable. And it should be, you know, stopped immediately. So the impact is terrible. And still, Venezuela is really having, you know, the people of Venezuela are suffering enormously. One of the additional consequences is the fact that Venezuela subsidized the treatment of special patients, such as people with marrow bone problems, cancer, and so on. And it's extremely difficult to obtain special medicine for this. And the sanctions prevent the Venezuelan government from being able to engage in financial transactions so that they can pay the specialized clinics around the world to cure people as a result of them of that several of them have died, you know, waiting for the money, which is Venezuelan money, which is being illegally retained. And that gives you an idea of how bad it is. And now Biden doesn't seem to be interested in changing anything at all, although the situation remains in a state of flux regarding that. We'll have to wait and see whether it changes in any way whatsoever. And I suppose linking to this issue about the sanctions, and we hope that under the Biden presidency, some of these things will change in relation to Venezuela and Iran and other countries as well, especially at this time of the pandemic and the crisis. I suppose, I mean, as we're looking at the coup anniversary today, and you also mentioned the coup the year before last in Bolivia, something that people watching might be interested in is if you think it'd be possible for the US to have another similar coup attempt in Venezuela in the future. Well, the... When you have a president, you know, of a different political party in the United States, some people get the impression that things are going to change quite dramatically, but they don't. And the reason is the machinery for intervention of the United States is permanent, it's quite stable and it's not elected. So you have the State Department, you have the CIA, you have the FBI, you have the National Endowment for Democracy, they're not elected. They just you know, continue doing what they do. And Presidents tend to just follow, being, being led by the nose, as it were, um, on this question. So given that they've failed so miserably for 20 years, and you know, particularly with this regime of sanctions, which has been so intense over the last period, any other country on earth would have collapsed by now. And this one hasn't. And in, quite, in fact, uh, President Maduro and the Bolivarian Revolution, although is facing enormous difficulties, has strengthened itself politically in many ways, not only nationally, but also internationally. Uh, on top of that, the relation of forces is changing in the region. So in desperation, my sense is that sections of the State Department, sections of the interference machinery of the United States have continued to try to wage a good time. Remember, only on the 13th of April 2020, there was a publicly televised coup d'etat organized and led by Mr. Juan Guaido and Mr. Leopoldo Lopez, you know, two extreme right wingers, and it was televised. And it, this was supported by certainly the United States. So they keep trying to get the military high officers to defect so as to create the conditions to actually go for a coup d'etat or split the military, which is what they would like to see. But the second thing is the mercenary attack that took place last year indicated to us that the United States is quite prepared to create some sort of massive disruption through the operation of some specialized military forces, such as you know bombings, terrorist attacks, assassination of people, and so on, which was part of the terrorist attack organized by the mercenaries uh, one year ago, um, then 
clearly what you see today in the border between Colombia and Venezuela, where it's totally clear that sections of the paramilitary, substantial sections of the paramilitary, we do not know what the figures are, uh, decided to organize a raid, invade militarily the ter Venezuelan territory and began to attack you know, military posts. And there were confrontations. And these count absolutely openly with the support of the Duke administration. And clearly the United States is behind it because I think it would be impossible for the Duke administration to go for something so dramatic uh, without you know, getting the permission as it were of whoever it is in the United States machinery that is behind. So these, I think has the intention to create some sort of provocation to see whether the Venezuelan government overreacts and can be presented as the aggressor, as the perpetrator, so as to justify some sort of serious intervention. Um, I think the possibility of a coup d'etat remains and the possibility of a US-led military interference in Venezuela continues to exist. Therefore, we should tell the Colombian government to cease their um, invasion of, of Venezuelan territory, they should organize in such a way to stop it because they have the power to stop paramilitary from interfering in Venezuelan territory and make sure that the Colombian government, you know, seeks an understanding of collaboration with the Venezuelan government to ensure that this doesn't happen and the things doesn't escalate. And we should also demand that the US government does exactly the same rather than encourage this, which not only creates tremendous tensions in the region, but also uh, destabilizes the whole of the Latin American region, which is not good for anyone. So we have to remain completely vigilant about this. In a second, we'll go on to what people can do in terms of lobbying and campaigning, but I thought it would be nice to also sort of have a positive note, if you like, in terms of we're talking about the anniversary of the coup against Hugo Chavez today. And you mentioned how Chavez had such a transformative impact across Latin America and beyond. Um, do you feel like with the things like the Chilean referendum result, with the Bolivian election result, hopefully with the Ecuadorian election result, and maybe I'm hearing even in Peru, um, a victory for the left, do you feel like there's kind of a renewal of that wave of Chavismo or the, red, the pink tide, as some people called it in Latin America? I think the most, the worst sin that the Venezuelan, the Bolivarian Revolution committed, as far as the United States is concerned, is not only having, you know, wager carried out very radical transformation of Venezuelan society and taking away the control of the, of the United States over the oil. That is a serious scene, but I think the most worrying one for the United States is the process of regional integration that Chavez began. This obviously took place, as you correctly indicate, on the back of the pink tie, where you know progressive government after progressive government was being elected in Latin America, in all the countries in the region, and as a result of that, there was a fantastic process that was extremely positive for the region, reduced poverty improve all sorts of infrastructure, create a better conditions for education and so on and so forth. I don't have the time to go into all the figures, but it was extremely positive. And just to give you an idea, between approximately 2003, 2004 to about 2014, 16, the number of people that were taken out of poverty in the whole region as a result of it was something like 100 million. So what we have now is something that is beginning again. Uh, the United States managed to score substantial successes over the last three or four or five years by, you know, being able to support or install right-wing regimes in key countries such as Argentina, certainly Mexico, Brazil, and so forth, changing the uh, political complexion of the region quite dramatically and isolated Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, and so on. Now, as a result, particularly of Number one, the election of López Obrador in Mexico, the election of Alberto Fernández in Argentina, which is two progressive governments that are collaborating with each other very nicely indeed and extremely closely. And then very importantly, the uh, defeat of the de facto regime of Añez in Bolivia by the mass, the Evo Morales political party in the recent elections which is extraordinary uh, success. 
um, create a, you know, transform the relation of forces quite dramatically. And then the Chilean referendum by which they voted in a referendum to change the economic model of neoliberalism for something as obtaining 77% in the, in the referendum, which is extraordinary. That gives you an indication of how terrible neoliberalism is. And now you have the Peruvian government is in massive crisis. You have the Paraguayan government is, is in a massive crisis. You have the Colombian government facing a serious challenge from the left, which, you know, poses the possibility that the left might win the elections, although we have to wait and see. And now there is a massive crisis in Brazil with Bolsonaro um, decapitating, politically that is, decapitating the um, top brass of the military in order to appoint a military supremo, a guy called Braga Neto, who is just going to try to establish some sort of military civilian semi-dictatorship, which is obviously not going to work. Um, the parliament, the Senate and the Congress are already saying that they are going com completely against this. So all of this is creating a fantastic context. And the important thing about this is that the right wing and the United States not only is not willing to offer anything in order to support Latin America, which is facing you know, a terrible situation with the pandemic and the economic crisis has ensued, but also the United States doesn't have any resources to offer anything. So we are moving very slowly but steadily towards a significant amount of restarting, uh, a significant process of restarting the uh, process of integration and collaboration, thereby isolating the right and hopefully neutralizing substantially the capacity of the United States to intervene or to continue to intervene in Latin America. Um, now, the question is, it seems to me, I suppose, if I can ask myself a question, is what we can do to help. Well, obviously, we have to intensify our solidarity, especially now that it's working. I mean, one of the things that made it difficult, I'm not saying it was the factor, but one of the things that made it difficult for the Agnes government in Bolivia to try to organize fraud or to prevent the election from, from taking place recently was international solidarity. You know, the number of people that went there, the number of delegations from all over the world, certainly from Europe and the United States to observe the elections, made it extremely difficult for the government to be able to actually organize a fraud, which is what they wanted because they knew they were going to lose the election. So, so international solidarity remains an absolutely crucial thing. And regarding the situation of Venezuela, is Venezuela has resources sufficient to deal with the issue of the pandemic and its own economy in a big way. And only in Europe, the amount of resources illegally retained by European financial institutions is in the region of $7,000 million. This is a huge amount. And this particularly, you know, I want to focus on the Bank of England that is illegally retaining uh, 31 tons of gold that belong to Venezuela, which today will be valued in the region of something like $2 billion. Um, this must be returned. And the Venezuelan government, because it's the moral thing to do, it's the right thing to do. Otherwise, they continue to commit by this fiat. They continue to commit, you know, a crime against the humanity of 30 million Venezuelans. The Venezuelan government has proposed not only once, several times, and it's the formal proposal is still on the table, which is this. They want these European institutions to retain the government, to retain the resources through the development program of the United Nations so that nobody can say or nobody can claim that the government of Venezuela is going to misuse these resources. So there is no reason on earth to actually maintain this. And the European Union, they recognize why though. So there is no reason legally to say they're not sure about who is the government to return it to. The only government that remains and continues to recognize Juan Guaido is the UK government. There is no morality in this and there is no political justification. So we need to intensify our pressures to the maximum so that you know these resources, which are absolutely vital to save thousands and thousands of lives in the context not only of the pandemic and what has caused already, but also in the context of the new strain, strains, I think they're called, 
of, you know, of the virus which are emerging in the UK and certainly in Brazil, which is already infecting Venezuela. So it's, it, this is desperate. We have to do it. And, you know, in, in terms of the positive, it seems to me, despite everything, the level of contamination in Venezuela for, by the coronavirus is very low. The number of people who have died, the accumulated number of deaths is less than 1,600 compared to any other country the extraordinary. There is a public service of health which continues to operate freely for all 30 million Venezuelans, and even better. Um, the Venezuelan government, the Maduro, President Maduro, has just given you know, to the people the house 3,500,000. 3, so the housing program and any other, many other social programs continue to remain completely active and continue to benefit the people despite all of this blockade. So the issue is imagine what it would be like if these resources were released, which belong morally, politically, and legally to the people of Venezuela and to the state of Venezuela. So we demand that this is done right away. Thank you, Francisco. And just to finish off, you mentioned the UK angle. Um, one of the campaigns that's been ongoing for a number of years now is about the gold that's um, been stored and kept, I suppose is a word, or stolen perhaps is a better word, in the Bank of England. And obviously that's something that could, that could be resolved and be used to help medical and other issues in Venezuela. In, absolutely. I think, you know, this, we, we have collate, collected um, I think in the region of, I mean, more than 12,000 signatures already, and this is, keeps growing. Um, I think we need to intensify that and we need to put pressure through all sorts of political means that we have, trade unions, individuals, pe people of public influence, to put pressure on the government. There is no justification, none whatsoever, to, for the UK government to participate as an accomplice in the violation, the systematic violation, literally daily, of the human rights which have been denied to 30 million Venezuelans by retaining illegally these resources. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you for the invitation.